because of the combination of what was happening with my new boss and now we just didn't get on, um, what's in my wife, they kind of came together like a crescendo, really. And um, I had a break in. This is Mr. Tough Guy, and I was that guy. I, you know, you couldn't break me. I didn't understand my uh, mental health. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Today on Beyond the Fail, we have a very special guest and the tables are turning and I'm interviewing my business coach and I'm really excited. So today we have Phil Nasu, who has over 40 years experience in business, is a former UK sales director where he oversaw a team of 440 franchisees and saw sales increase from 69 million to 100 million pounds under his tenure. He is now a business coach and is ranked one of the top 10 business coaches in the world. In this episode, Phil takes us on a riveting journey through the highs and lows of his long entrepreneurial career, sharing invaluable insights gained from facing near failure. He shares starting out launching a business during the horrific 1980s recession and grappling with financial challenges which saw him face bailiffs in his home while his wife was pregnant with their first child. Phil delves into the lessons learned and emphasizes the importance of having a robust action plan and the transformative power of belief in overcoming obstacles. Reflecting on the invaluable impact of mentorship throughout his career, Phil shares poignant moments from his journey, including the lessons learned from seeing someone else's business fail while he was managing them. The conversation also explores the dynamics of delivering exceptional customer experience and the importance of that and the consequences of resisting adaptation in the ever-involving business landscape. He opens up about the challenging period in his life where he faced burnout after dealing with pressure, stress and conflict in his corporate leadership role. This provided profound lessons for him and a new perspective on the priorities in his life admitting that he was often absent from his family, often prioritizing his career. So tune in for a candid and inspiring conversation with Phil Nasu, where he offers practical advice from his wealth of experience to aspiring entrepreneurs, addressing fear and shame often associated with failure. This is Beyond the Fail with Phil Nasu. Phil, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Well, I'm super excited about this one as i mentioned offline this is weird to turn the tables on you know my coach like this so um yeah i might might get my revenge kind of thing (laughs) um so phil take us back where did it all start for you in business where did it all start um so when i was 21 um that was over 40 years ago uh, a friend of mine had gone into business uh, selling garage equipment. And uh, at the time, uh, this was around 1983, uh, and we were in a very bad recession. Mrs., you know, the, the recession Mrs. Thatcher got us out of. Uh, Some would agree how she did it was right or wrong, but that's a different debate, I guess. Um, but it was very touched, three million people unemployed. The company I worked for, I'd, I'd got a graduate scheme and I was a typical company young man, just finished coming to the end of my degree, but they were laying people off like mad. And a friend of mine had gone into business, I think, as I say, on the crash equipment, and I went to spend the day with it. And I thought, oh, I could do this. I'm an engineer, a graduate engineer. Uh, he's selling garage equipment. Oh, this will be easy. I can do it. So my career started out setting up a business selling garage equipment through a franchise. Um, and that's when I started. Um, 
And this this kind of walks me in a little bit to what you asked me about failure. And uh, though I haven't actually directly had a business fail, I've got pretty close to it. And at 21, I was that typical 21-year-old who believed I was going to conquer the world and be driving a Ferrari by 25. Um, and it was a far difficult age then because we didn't have the reach that we do to customers because of what the technology we have today with selling online and internet and all that. You had to take your product and put it in front of the, uh, the face of the purchaser or bring the purchaser to you. In my case, I took the product to the purchaser um, to try and sell them it. And I, I went into business very naively doing everything that I teach to all my clients today as a business coach. I did everything the opposite. I had this belief that the client, the customer, would be waiting with arms open saying to me, I've been waiting for you. What can I buy? Show me what you've got. I want to buy it. I want to buy it. I want to buy it. And I remember the first week, I don't remember numbers because it was so long ago, but I do remember, I can, it's sort of weird how you remember certain clear things in your head. I, and the reason I can remember it is my be, what turned out to be my very best customer I used to see on a Thursday night. And the, uh, the Thursday, uh, this my first Thursday, he didn't actually buy anything off me this week, but I always remember that route on a Thursday. Uh, I got home on that Thursday and I sold one thing. And I'd pl- I sold about twenty-five pound, and I think for the week I'd done two hundred and fifty pound. And my budget break-even—that was the only thing I did have. I knew what I needed to sell to pay for it, and my budget was about sixteen hundred pound. And my wife, Mandy, said to me, "How's it gone?" And and I, and I said, um, "How's it gone?" And I said, "Well, I've done about." I don't know what the number was, £250. And she said, what do you need to do in 16? I said, but it'll get better. It'll get better. It will. And we, two, three, four, I don't remember any of the numbers. It, it got better, but not enough better. And by month three, I couldn't pay my payments. And I do remember one particular night. I, I'd, I'd had a quite a good day, actually, and I came home. don't know what that. I just remember it was winter because it was dark. And I'd gone into the house and within about two or three minutes there was a knock on the door so there was, there was obviously two burly um, repossession people uh, who had landed and were waiting for me coming home when they knocked on the door and I had I, I was very lucky because I had an ace card that they weren't expecting and that was my wife being pregnant and uh, they came in and they said we've come to repossess the van I can't remember how many months in arrears I was, somewhere between three and six months. And I said, but you can't take it. My wife burst into tears and what are we going to do? Well, what have I been? And, 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 and somehow the, these two guys, had that, one of them at least, maybe both had the heart. And I gave them my day's takings, which I don't know what it was, but it, it wasn't a month's worth of payments for the van. And that's kind of really when I started to realise I rocked the lot, when it hit rock bottom. And I was sitting there with my wife, thinking this is all going to implode. I might have hauled them off a little bit, this all going to implode, because it wasn't, the sales weren't getting where they were. And I then sat down and I made a little plan. I don't remember much about the plan, but one of the, in the plan, there were two things, is I put a promotion together on one product. I knew it had come on promotion, and I rang up, and I ordered lots of this it was a it was a small toolbox, quite a I guess, I guess a bit bigger than a small filing cabinet in back in those bits. And I go home the next night and or two night two or three nights later and the garage was full and they were sat on the drive as well. I can't I'd ordered a stupid number like fifty. And I'd worked out for the no and sold risk both. But I need but I had nothing to lose. I thought if I can go and sell these fifty on this deal, I'll turn it around. And I do remember the uh, the company, uh, the franchise would bring me up and said, we just need to check you've got the number right here. I think it was 50 I'd ordered. Are you sure it wasn't five? No, nope, 50. So you, you do know they're non-returnable. 
Well, I knew they would be because if I went bust, they'd want me, they'd want them back just to get some money back. So I was on a no win it. And then the other thing I went to do, I went to and I show, I went to see my boat manager. And in those days, you could get in front of a bank manager in his office and sit down with him. And I sat down with him and told him a plan. And he, he, I didn't treat him as a fool because he, he could see the problem. He could see my bank balance, the money coming in and the money going out. And I put a plan together. And that was my first, that was my learning of how I mitigated my failure. I went out, I don't remember exactly how quick I sold them boxes, but I sold them very quickly. I don't remember if I did it in five days or seven or eight days, but I sold out very quickly those boxes. And all I did like, every day, I filled the van with seven, eight, I can't remember if we could get on the van, but six, seven, eight, two boxes. And I went around every call. And I was not leaving that call until one person in that call or a garage bought a toolbox off me. And then I went to the next and the next and the next and the next. And that, I would say, from that day onwards was my first learning of planning. And I got to the end of the first year and survived. It, it didn't change the world overnight. It brought some cash to I got off the bay list off my back from my van. Um, and it made the bank balance a little healthier. But then what I did is I put I, I stopped going out and expecting something to happen. I had a plan every week. I ran I ran promotions, a different promotion every week. Um I remember I got into real big trouble on one promotion from the company and I had solicitors right into me. Because what I did in it, I didn't know this was illegal to do. Um Anybody who bought a product off me that day got a lottery ticket. You, uh, you remember the, the original scratch-off lottery right. tickets? Well, they were only a pound, yeah. and it was when they were first launched. And I had product going off, and, you know, uh, uh, the only worry I had is if somebody won £10,000 or something, you know, what would I do? Was it my money? or Well, that's, you know, I could have that spin in there. I used to run maybe yours. Maybe. I used to do all these promotions. Uh, uh, you know, all sorts of different things from scratch cars to um, if you bought something, you got, you got a, I'd have a raffle ticket and I'd have a big box with all different raffle things in it and everything. I did, I looked throughout the years to do promotions on Easter eggs, Easter, stuff at Christmas. And what I learned was I wasn't the best salesperson, I, I was becoming a good business person. But I became quite a good marketeer. And all the way through that, I learned you have to have a plan. And it sounds like I'm promoting what I do, but it kind of set me off down, down that journey, which kind of takes me to my second story, really, of real I'll fun. pause you there, Phil. It's, yeah. Can I just pause you there? I just got some follow-up questions. Um, so when you say plan you made a plan with the bank manager what, what what did that look like and what do you define as a plan was that a payment plan was that a plan for your business no, no. what was it I, I i went and sat down with him and showed him my plan and i think because of one he was a the i well, my territory used to work in the yorkshire dales so he was a bank manager to farmers so the bulk of his clients, the big clients, were all farmers. So he was that kind of bank manager who saw something in people. He was a people person. And I guess with me, he saw this young, very honest individual, because I was honest with him. I didn't give him anything. I had a written out plan, not a financial plan. I had product, what the promotions were doing. I did show the number of the sale and what profit would generate and when I would have it sold by. I don't remember the detail, but, but I had this plan for about eight, mm. ten weeks of everything that I had coming in, what I was doing and why. And I, and I said, this will turn me around. And I did promise him one thing. I made him a real honest promise. I, I, this was our deal. I had to bank every day. And after two weeks, he said, if I go see you going the wrong way and your plan isn't working, I am going to stop it. So I had a double incentive. So the incentive was, in effect, I've only got two weeks to get it going in the right direction and then continue it. But that's the deal. And in that point, he took a chance on me. And so that plan was, I don't remember the detail of it so long ago, 40 years ago, is 
which I showed to my manager. I was my manager. It was probably the first time he'd ever seen anything like that. I think most people came in and just, I need your help. Can you see me through for another X amount of money over so many time? Yeah. I'll, I'll and just have some chat. And he he maybe took his decision based on history with other clients that done it before, even just hit a bad spot will come out of it. Particularly if you're a farmer, you know you've got an asset in many cases, machinery, maybe even one in the farm. Uh, but me, I think he did it off because I was the first people to come in with a plan. And interestingly, our relationship was brilliant. And he retired about a year before I finished that first business. And every day he saw me, and as I come in the bank, not every time he saw me, but he used to put his hand up and say, you're still going well, I can see it's looking great, you know. And, um, you know, when he retired, my business was in a very strong position. I was doing really well. Uh, and I, I will always be thankful to him. I'm sure he's not around anymore, but. I'll always be thankful to him because uh, without his belief in me, if I'd have come out of that bank, uh, I would have had to start, I wouldn't quite say lying, but I got as close to it because I'd have had to start not paying other people to try and somehow move the money. Because I, so, I had the toolbox turned up. The first problem I had is the people wanted the money for the toolboxes. So I'd have had to, have to make some story. In your- yeah. So um, I don't know how it would have gone, and but... I do know he made the challenge that was in front of me easier. And it all started out because I was so naive. I just came into business thinking people would be queuing up. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that that question about belief in a minute. Um, but how did that feel at the time? You know, you've got a, a pregnant wife, you've got bailiffs at the door, you've got a bank manager on your back. I mean, did you feel kind of, backed into a corner and and like you might not be able to get kind of get out very scared and I think more so one thing I didn't do that I probably should have done I didn't share much of it I well I didn't share any of it until the bailiffs turned up with my wife because I felt at the time it wasn't fair to put that burden on that but that was wrong because um You know, one of the things I think in business is you need a very supportive partner. You need a voice to talk to, something to share. And um, so I had to carry it around with me all the time. And, you know, I would, I'd get, I'd finish my last call. And in them days, I used to get a calculator out and I'd get my till roll calculator and put all my figures in and I'd add my collections up and I'd look at it and then do the numbers and go, oh. Because I'd started to work out in 60, I can't remember what my exact budget was then in first year, but it was 1,600 pounds on something. I do remember that. But, you know, what's that? That's roughly 300 and some pound a day. And when you've only done 50 pound or 85 pound, so you're then thinking, oh, tomorrow I've got to do 700 and something to catch back up or 600 and something to catch back up. And it kept getting as the week went on to Friday. I was not catching up. The gap was just getting bigger, and so it was scary. And so then I wasn't making payments to people. The only people I was paying, there was I was paying three people. Um, I was paying my dip for my diesel at the petrol station, and that was always cash. And I was paying my supplier. I didn't pay anybody else. I remember, I remember me and my wife. I couldn't afford to put petrol in the car. I had no money to put petrol. So we went shopping to Tesco's in my van. And paying for the to- shopping out the weeks out of the day's take, that that week's t- the, the Friday's take in yeah. to Tesco or wherever it would be, I don't know who it was then. But uh it was that bad. It was we were living hand to mouth. Hand to mouth mm-hmm. every time. And it didn't have any staff at that point. Didn't have any staff. I had all the usual problems where I'd have all the envelopes building up. I mean, net to date emails coming in, but in them days it was all the envelopes building up from the VAT man, the you know the, the van lease company, and all the other sort of people like that. Uh, demand, final demand, and you know we we sometimes watch it on television those sort of things. But I was there looking at all these final demands, hiding them from my wife, coming in the drawer so she couldn't see them, and that was a mistake. I regret. Did you ever think about just? Quitting, giving up, and getting it. I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't give up. I, 
one of the things I didn't mention is when I did this, I was uh, when I was a graduate engineer, I was based in Leeds, and we moved up into the Yorkshire Dales to a place called Beedale, and we rented a house. So I had nowhere to go. Where was I going to go? It was either up or fall off totally, and um, um, you know, paying the rent on the house late and having to go into the estate agent and paying the money in cash you know, to, to get through another month. And um, mm. I, I, I just had that belief that I can do this. Um, as I said, about month six, seven, and when I did that toolbox promotion, that's when I, that all changed because of that plan I put together. I was forced into the plan. I had two choices. I either put my hands up and, and, and tell them, I, I, and I had that, you know, when you've been there with failure, it, it's the shame is the word I would use. It's the shame of failure in, I had the shame of failure to my wife. When I went into bed business, I borrowed some money from my wife's manager's dad. So I had to face him. I guess the bank manager and other people. And then where were we going to live? What was I going to do? You know, all of that. And I couldn't, I couldn't look at that. I had to find, I, had to, I just kept pushing on, thinking it would get better. And it did until that night of the bailist. Then I knew I had to do something because it was out. You know, my wife knew it was sick, there was something serious to come. The secret was out, yeah. Mm. Do you think, you know, you mentioned about you had a certain sort of naivety, was your words, then about. Uh, you know I suppose business and I'm just interested to know whether you view failure as the same as you did then because you just talked a lot about the shame of failure do you think failure and failing in business is shameful now with your you know 40 years experience that depends um, for some people they should feel shame because they, they did some real weird things that created the uh, thing. But in sometimes it's where another business impacts a business and the business fails. That's not their fault and should never feel shame from that. If you've done everything and followed everything you should do and gone and learned it. And, and I, in my, in my role, I, you know, the size of businesses I coach today are a lot larger than were when I started out. But I do come across small quite a lot of small business owners and they're doing things totally wrong and i'll sit down with them and i'll give them some basics to start doing just some real basic changes to start on the first one would be to create a budget figure out what your break even is do a budget and then i'll 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 see them two three four five weeks later and say how did you go with the budget i'm done it why haven't you done it i haven't had time well, you, you, your business is failing and you're not, do, why are you, and I'll give them some other thing. And, you know, there'll be two or three things I'll have given them, some very basic things. Then I just think it, maybe people don't feel shame and they should because they just go, I don't care if I fail, if I failed. I, I, just, I don't care, do you know what I mean? But I cared. That's where the shame comes from. I think I cared so much and I was letting so many people down, my wife particularly, uh, it, it, it does bring that shame inside you. Should I have felt shame? I don't know. That's a that's a difficult question to remember back. I think I, I thought I was doing it some of it right, but I did do I did do in the end something. But yeah, it's it's maybe a different time. I don't know. It's uh, but yeah, I definitely at that time that would be the biggest thing. Emotion I felt was shame. And you talked a lot about belief. You said it in in two ways, really. You said, firstly, you, you believed that you'd get a Ferrari by 25. But then you also had a belief that um, the clients would op would have open arms, you know, when you were um, yeah. getting into them and, and, and waiting. I think it was two types of belief now, I believe. Yeah, where's that come from? One's a naivety belief. We go in with... Uh, we just believe it will happen. It comes. We believe in ourselves that we will do it. And uh, sometimes some naivety goes into there. But I think if you put belief around plans, whatever adversity in business is, is it's the belief that will get you through. It's the belief that stops you giving up. It's the belief that still makes you get up 
when the alarm goes off at six o'clock and prepare for the day and go out and give the very best customer experience you can. Um, and the belief that, you know, one of the things I believe is uh, very much so is if you follow the follow a business plan, you can achieve it if you've got the belief and the determination to follow it. What makes failure is lots of different things. Then is that you're not the you you you, you you've not got that belief, so you in effect not na- you don't naturally do this, and you maybe have this kind of a saying we just curl up under the covers, hoping that something will change, um, or you know we 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 carry on doing exactly the same thing. And I don't know where that old saying comes from, but uh, somebody said it. You know, you carry on doing the same thing. Every day, think there's been a change. It's the sign of insanity, which it is. You've got to change. If it's not working, change something. But still have the belief in the center of you that you could do that. And going back to that story is I did change something. If something kicked me to change, the two bailiffs and it getting out, that was my change in, in that caused the change, that it kind of, kind of chain reaction kicked up from that. Um but even up to that point, I had the belief that it would, I had the belief I could do this. It would get better, better. It's just I wasn't changing what I was doing. I was waiting for the change. What I did, what the Bailey's did was they created a chain reaction that made me change and change the way I did business, change the way I sold, change how I dealt with my customers. I didn't, I didn't, didn't wait for the change. I created the change. That's what made me you know, turn it around. Given that you started a business during a recession, was there any concern from your parents that that wasn't going to work? How were they supportive of your of your endeavours? My parents were devastated. I just graduated from Leeds University as a design engineer. Um, I was back in them days the first one in the family ever go to university. Um, so when I mentioned I was going to go in, in essence be a salesperson I might be a self-employed salesperson but I was going to be a salesperson they were devastated and my dad telling me have you not looked at the figures the interest I mean back then interest rates were about 15% uh, you know we have our worries today but wow it was different a different world then I mean to be fair price of houses weren't at the same level either but, so that kind of brings it a bit into shape but uh, when you were in business, your overdraft, if you were in overdraft, it was, you know, a big interest rate on overdrafts. Um, and uh, he, he just thought that I was nuts. But I was, and I am a very driven person. Um, I'm very driven by to be successful. Um, and I just had that belief, I'll, do, I'll be successful. A recession or not, and I've, I've come over the years to understand that. I always say this to people, you know, a recession is about the economy, the overall economy. It's not about the individual. There are highly successful people making it fantastic in recessions, and there are people failing in recessions. And in a boom, there are people doing highly successful, and guess what? There are just as many failing in a, in a boom. Just the same. You know, a rece- a recession. When people say a recession, that means our GDP has gone below zero. And a boom, a good boom in this country, my goodness, would be at five, six percent. That would be a boom. Well, those numbers are actually that big. You know, success means you're growing by 10, 15, 20, 30 percent. You know, so you, you can be, I, I, I believe today a recession, you know, I've got clients today, we're, we're, we're not quite in a recession, but we're still climbing along the bottom, um, who are being highly successful in this economy. And so I, w- I, I didn't see as sophisticated as that back in 21. I just had that belief I was going to be, I'll be fine. And how did you overcome the reaction of your parents being devastated? How did you cope with that? Didn't I didn't I just ignored it. Right. It sounds awful. I just subtly ignored it, shut it out. Did that affect your relationship at all? Did it affect my relationship with my mum and dad? No. Um, because they never knew when I you know, this whole journey I was in that first year. They didn't know how I was doing. 
like I said, I certainly didn't share it with my mum and dad because I haven't shared it with my wife. So, so they, they have no idea. Bad, bad conversation. <laughs> that would have been a bad conversation. So time I got to year two, three, and four, they just saw me as a success. And um, they, you know, mum and dad always just saw me as the entrepreneur and I was going on. I mean, they would, they they are more very old school, traditional, kind of that kind of, they come from the 30s and 40s and I just, my parents were born just after the war, um, but they come from that era of, and, uh, of their view is, you know, you go out to work, work for one employer, come home, you know, kind of, my dad was a policeman, for instance, my mum was a cleaner, so I didn't come from a successful, wealthy family. Um, and, you know, they're that generation that saved for everything. You know, they bought their first house when my mum and dad were, well, I was what, about 14, 15, a very small little house. Of, I sometimes drive back past if we've been that part of the world and I look at it and go, wow, it's, some people have got garages bigger than that, you know, but it was home. And, it, and I never went back without anything. It was just a different era. So I wanted something different. That Margaret Thatcher era, they were, she was promoting go and go out there and make a life that's what she promoted and i was one of those kids that did and is that where some of the belief come from because it's obviously it keeps it's a pattern that keeps and a word that keeps coming up in this and even when your parents were devastated even during a recession you still had an inner belief that you were going to succeed i'm just trying to get to the bottom of where that came from so i don't know really because or, it could have been, I'm sure she maybe had some influence on it, but my brother's not like me. We get on with, my, my and my brother are opposites. Um, my wife would say you should be more like your brother. Do you know what I mean? My brother, Michael's great, but, you know, Michael was so laid back, you know, just lets life take you where he is and, you know, he's, he's had a great life himself. Do you know what I mean? Uh, me, I... When I get to the other end of my story, I was the one going driven, and in the end, I joined the corporate ladder later in my life, uh, and I did a lot of things of there. So I was, I am not like mom and dad or my brother. I'm, uh, the one person everybody says I'm like is my granddad. Um, my granddad was a miner, but he uh, um, he won the pools, not a large amount. I don't know the exact amount, but it was quite a lot of money in the day. And my mom said it changed our lives. Stop. They didn't move to a big six-bedroom house, and I guess back in them days, a Jaguar were on the drive. Um, but my, my granddad won the pools in about 1955, so where I'm at. Not a huge number, and it, was, it wasn't like the big win, whatever that big win was. But he bought, instead of just buying a big house, he bought a share into a scrapyard. So there's my granddad in mine, comes up, and then he's working in the scrapyard, building a business, doing it, and that's what it is. So... I've got that last wink where if it's a family trade, that's where it comes from. He was the same. And for a miner, did really well. You know, he always had a new car on the drive. But he worked hard. And uh, in them days, he did. He bought, instead of just squandering the money, and he went and bought Sherman's Crap Yard. And when he retired, he sold it. He sold his share. And I don't know what came out of that, but you know, that's what he did. Did you have any entrepreneurial? role models or mentors when you were younger? Uh, one of the things I've had, I've always had mentors and coach, most coaches most of my life. I've seeked them out. Um, I look for people, you gen they're always generally up there were then, certainly up to my 40s, older than me. Um, wise owls, people who have been successful, wise, and I'd search them out and I would ask lots of questions of them. And then... They enjoyed, people like that tend to enjoy passing the knowledge on. And it was interesting that I've, you know, I've been in and out, I've either run my own business or I've been coaching businesses in this small period in the corporate world for 40, over 40 years. And um, in all of that time, I bet there's only been two or three years where I haven't, if you had all the months up, I haven't had a mentor or a coach. And I, I, even being a coach, I, I think it's really important. It keeps me 
focus keeps me, you know, understanding what my business plan is and moving forward and being something making me accountable to it. Human beings, I believe, we're, we are, I may have this wrong, but it feels like we're innately lazy. We're all looking for the shortcut. Well, there isn't one. So you need somebody to keep you to account. And um, I was talking to a lady today and she'd ran me to a client of mine and she's setting up a business and it's quite a nice idea what she's got. And But she said, I have no idea how to run a business. No idea. She was trying to ask me how I work. And I guess the way I put it to in a very, very simplistic thing, I said, well, January is the time of gyms. Lots of people are joining gyms. And by April, most of them will have left. And But the ones who make it at a gym start off with a PT. They invest bigger money. They invest in themselves and hire a PT. And the PT is the one that brings the accountability. The one is the one who's that they, they have to be there because they don't want to let him down at 6 o'clock every morning. And is the one that when you're pedaling the bike and you've done 20 minutes and you feel like your legs are about to fall off and you, you just get off. PT will let you get off. He keeps you going to 40 minutes and you walk out of the gym like dying. But, you know, six months later, you don't. A year later, you look like this incredibly healthy fit. But most of us don't go and hire a PT in for, the, for that gymnasium or anything like that. Well, as what I do is similar, but for business. So I've had love for such those people out for me all my life. I've done that. So I had a, I had a couple of Brilliant. Even at 21, 22, the bank manager, to a certain extent, was a coach to me. That I had a coach. He's not with us anymore, Dave Wilson, who was brilliant. Uh, he worked, helped me, and got me through it. Another guy, Steve Rowe, really old school, old owl, do you know what I mean? Who told me as it was and what I needed to do. We have a lot of people on. Well, it, everything from sales, how to approach a customer, how marketing, uh, finance, um, they taught me people, communication skills. Steve were particularly great on communication skills. I don't think his or what he taught me back then in the late 80s would work today. His communication was really brutal. And um, if you were, you know, in a company, probably HR would have you, and, it, you know, there'd be problems. But back in those days, it was a different time. He taught me communication for that era, and it worked really well for me. Yeah. So yeah, they taught me a, a lot about myself, uh, being truthful to myself and to everybody else. But I think in the end, what they t I've learned to learn all of them on the way is to to accept and know my weaknesses and try and put them and try and do something about and improve them in some way. And the other one is, you know, I, I don't know which one of my coaches taught me this. But I've read it in different books along the way of something similar, but I was taught this uh, back in the 80s, that the thing that makes success in business is delivering an unbelievable customer experience because that's what brings the customer back. And what I see in business today all over the place is business owners don't do it. They don't deliver an unbelievable experience i've i've had an experience i'm not going to talk about it because it wouldn't be right to mention them the brand but this is a big brand and the most appalling customer experience i could ever describe and i will say it was a car a brand and it started off this i always remember the really and it went just if you look at this what we were saying i ended up giving the car back at the end after six months but this brand this was quite an expensive car in most people's eyes. Um, but they handed me the keys to this quite expensive car, two keys on a Tyra. And I remember looking at the sales girl and going, is this normal that you was handling my keys on a Tyra? And she just said, she just looked at me and said, we haven't got any key rings, we've run out. And then I, should, <laughs> I just, there you went. Now, maybe I should have handed the keys back. I didn't. So I just thought, maybe. But the whole brand, that customer experience is that's what I'm talking about. Something as simple as that. That was, it was the most expensive car, car I'd always wanted to buy. And the experience was destroyed in that one moment. And it went, got worse and worse and worse. It was endemic, but it is what it is, you know. And then I've moved on from board. I see 
No, it wasn't a Ford Focus, and it and it's uh, it, it's I see that everywhere and around me that a lot of businesses, and that's one of the things they took. I was taught is that uh, is there's those two things, but the second one, you know, that customer experience. Hmm. No, great lesson. So I'm intrigued. How did the garage business and and your journey with that change over time, and what success did you see? Well, I, I was going to, I'm going to tell you a little uh, part um, that happened that made me come to understand failure. It wasn't my failure and not listening and everything. And um, when I, what happened was the the, the company, uh, a company approached me to, who wanted me to go and teach their salespeople sales in the same industry that I was in. And, um, I remember uh, uh, I, uh, they, I walked into the story of why I went to do it. I'd actually, now when I think back, I don't know why I did it, but I think the package became so good I decided to go and do it. I was doing well in business. My friend who actually got me into it at the time tried to talk me out. I said, you mad. The business is doing really well. But for whatever reason, uh, I did. I don't remember. But um, in the second, third week it started, I was asked to go and spend the time with this salesperson doing some of the things I do. Um, and the area I got allocated to look after was the northeast. And the northeast back in then would have been the very late eighties, early nineties was a tough part. You know, they had a lot of businesses closing down. British Steel had gone, the shipyards had gone, mines were shutting. It was a tough area. Uh, and I, but in there there was some sparks of success. But I went out with this, uh, meet this guy. And um, I can remember him to his time, and um, I used this expression with him. It sounds awful, and you may end up putting this out, but uh, at the end of the first day, I said to him, did you used to be in the SAS? I would remember this sentence. I've used it a few times with people. And he said, well, what the heck does that mean? I said, you're the only salesperson I've ever seen that's gone into a call, come out, and nobody even realised you'd been there. And 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 I, and I started digging into this business with this young man, and everything he'd been taught, he had ignored. He had an answer for. He wasn't going to do it. And I looked at the condition of the van. I looked at the condition of the stock. It was very poor. Uh, the customer experience was very poor. The customer relationship was very poor because of their experience and I remember sitting down with him and I created a list of everything he needed to start doing I spent four days with him I do remember that uh it was the Monday to the Thursday and I spent four days and at the end of it I sat down for about two hours with him and went through this list and what I want to change him from Monday morning it was all around the van I wanted all the stock stripping off and everything cleaning and polishing and re-putting back and and things spacing out a bit different just so we look like we had a bit more stock than we did. And his attire of the walls that I've talked about, I don't remember much about that, but I went through everything. And I arrived back on the following week. I don't remember what day it was. I had two days with him. Nothing had changed, not one thing. And that's when I talk a little bit about failure. If you're not going to change and... I ended up bringing the management up and saying, we need to stop this, this guy. He owes you a lot of money. He's going to owe you a lot more money. This is going to go badly long. And he'd done exactly what I did, except he was living with his mum and dad. He, did, he, he was probably in his late 20s with some mum and dad. And he'd done the same thing as I'd done to my wife, Mandy. I haven't told them anything. So they asked me to do an audit, you know, well, I can't remember what I turned up with this audit, but I do know it was dreadful, a disaster. And um, I had to sit down, and, and, and that's when I first saw failure in it for what it is. I had to sit down with him and his mum and dad, because they're down on the table, and they're 89 or something, 1989, somewhere around that, and lay it all out, and the shock. And he just looked at me blank. And said, Are you telling me the show's over? Yeah, I'm telling you the show's over. 
And he was, it is what it is. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't that. He didn't care about his business, and yes, that's the way I'm describing. But that's when I see failure in its very worst format because it impacted other people's lives. I don't remember the detail, but I do remember a little bit that I'm convinced, if, if I sit here today, that his mum and dad gave him the money to start that business. It was all the customers who were owed things. There were other people that were owed money, and they were all going to be damaged by it. So that's when I think it's wrong failure. Since that might not align with some people, to where failure has just gone wrong for all the different reasons, you know, or you've been a victim of it, or you. But when somebody doesn't change anything after all the advice they gave on on that Thursday night, ready for Monday morning or Tuesday when I got that, and he didn't do any any of it at all, and didn't care when I said the show's over. And his mum and dad, I remember his mum crying her eyes out. Yeah. And and that's why I kind of have this feeling, of, I can't remember the details, that it was them that had still took the money. And it was a massive amount of money for this family. And, uh, yeah, that was my first sign of failure. And when I started that role and working with every one of the salespeople, I would not allow somebody to fail to that level. If they were the, if they were the wrong person, it just wasn't for them business, I would stop it very early. Um, so I, my drive was to make sure nobody fails or if they had to fail, they got out quick as we can without them being financially damaged and all the other people damaged. And that's my mentor even today is um, to, so if a business comes to me that's, and I look at it and it's at a point of failure and it's already in the financial, I, it's not business I will coach. Because all I'm not, all I'm doing is trying to coach it to get it out of the business so there isn't too many people damaged. And that's not fun. It's not fun to do that. There are other people who do that who are better than me. So I, I don't enjoy that. But that was my first sign of failure. To see it in its core was fun. Do you think some of that, I suppose, approach where you didn't want any businesses to kind of fail or if they did fail there would be limited financial impacts did that come from the fact that you were nearly in that position as well and you saw how damaging that could have been to your lives um and your family's life no i saw it from that young man I saw it from that, that I was never going to sit across a dining room table ever again with somebody and, and tell them and one person didn't care and the impact it had on other people. For me, yes, but I was the person who had and something happened to me and I did the change. He did. He had the opportunity. If I'd have come back on the Tuesday morning and all the things had listed out and been done ready for a new week, we would have started from afresh. He, he, would, he was like me. The difference is... He didn't care and he didn't want to do anything about it. He wasn't bothered. Yeah. And I was. So it was different. And so that's why when I come across that, that um, I, I guess going forward to people I work with is, um, I have a pretty tough selection process I take clients to be for me to coach them, is I'm looking to find out, do they have a powerful vision? So can they see what they're going to do? Are they prepared to change? Are they prepared to put the work in? That's what I look for. Um, and that comes from what I did, yes. But I also am looking out for that young man type. So yeah. I think you know, I'm going to sprinkle some fairy dust and change the world for them. It just isn't, that isn't how it works. So, yes, I guess your question, trying to answer that, is... Yes, a little bit from me, but the bigger part is from what I decided I was going to live and sit and allow anybody to get themselves into that position. So fast forwarding, one of the other things I know you wanted to talk about was the fact that you say you haven't failed in business. And obviously you came close in, in, in that year one and obviously had a significant kind of challenge to deal with. But you haven't actually failed in business um, in your 40 years. I think the first question for me is, why do you think that is? Determination, no doubt. I have very steely determination. Uh, belief, as we've talked about. 
uh, coaches and mentors I've had around me who've guided me. Um, driving me to do well. My wife pulls me upon that too a lot of the time and tells me, you know, why are you always looking for the next thing? I used to be like that in my 30s and 40s and 50s particularly. Uh, um, I, I, I wanted to be the... I'm going to talk, we fast forward, I'm going to talk about how I've changed because it's made me more successful. Is I had this determination to be the very best, to always be the best, wanted to be number one. Uh, that has emulated into my son, my my middle son. Well, all my kids there, but I'll, I'll talk, I'll just give a bit about that, of how that's, that, that number one is. So, um, where we've brought the kids up is that belief that they can achieve anything they want in life. And my son is, oldest son is 38, deputy head in school, science teacher, and then we're deputy head, so done very well at his age of life. My middle son came in to work for the business in the, in the franchise I worked in and um, became the number one in the country, number one franchisee in the country. And then the multi-franchise, he became... Uh, if you have a multi-franchise and was number one in the country, and he wasn't just number one by a little bit, he was about 20% in front of number three. Number one and two were quite high, but they were, those two were about 23 But the number two would be number one for a long time, so my son came along. And then he he's then moved on, and he's now uh, the youngest, or was when he started, the youngest that ever taken on McDonald's franchise. So he now owns a number of uh, McDonald's franchises. So very successful, most people call him. Uh, You know, there he is at 36 and he's a McDonald's franchisee. Rare. And then my daughter, a nurse, unbelievable mother as well, and I've just watched her go all the way up in the nursing career, very done really well. And, And that's just putting that belief in what there can be anything they want to be. My daughter is... Not driven like my middle son at all, our middle son at all. And then as children, you know, she has more of Mandy in her life. And uh, just an unbelievable moment now. But also going back into nursing again, um, you know, she has different things. She's the best, you're always biased with kids, but one of the best moms I've ever seen. Never tells the kids off, always asking them questions just like I do as a coach questions, questions, questions. <laughs> you know, so instead of saying, put those toys away, she'll say, do you think it'd be a good idea before we go to bed? We have a game of putting the toys away. That's how she, you know, she has that kind of. And I watch her and go, it's just amazing to watch. So, you know, all of those kind of things. So, um, I've always had that steel in me, and I want to be the best. And that's kind of been the drive. In my last five or six years of what I'm going to talk about, that changed. And I've discovered a different way to be successful in terms of the the fact that you you know that the fact that you haven't failed did that have any well given that you were kind of had a belief in you anyway did that just Mm -hmm. ramp up that belief did that just make you i don't know did that have any sort of negative effects did it make you kind of um overconfident arrogant I would say maybe I was never. I would never describe myself as arrogant. Some may. I don't know. I, uh, I don't know the answer for that. To be fair. But it did. Uh, I, I kind of went into uh, the, the proper corporate world. I became a sales director for a fairly large corporation, and I ran the UK and Irish division. And I had a great uh, managing director uh, who was a great mentor and coach to me as well. We didn't always say I to I you tend not to at that level. Um, but he listened, and I listened, and I learned a lot from him. And then he retired, and we had a new person come in. I don't want to get too much into that. But we absolutely were opposed on on people. Let's put it that way, on how you look after treat people. Absolutely opposed. And he didn't like that. And so wanted me out of the company. No doubt. And um, 
it worked out well for me because there was an agreement because of my past performance um, that they they would have to do something financially. So in the end, it, it worked quite well for me. But it was a very difficult time. and um, But it was the right time because what happened was uh, is you talk about the arrogance. I'd got into the corporate world, had climbed up. I was moving up through the company and I got to where I was. And I, on that journey, certainly in the last three, four years of it, I forgot about my family. And I say this to some people about failure is I got as close as you can get to a divorce. And I remember this day uh, quite clearly, another clear day, these days kind of come to you, don't they? I was, there was a particular road when I left my house is to come out of it down the road and go down this road towards the fish and chip shop. And it was a Friday night. I did weird things linked together. And there was a removal van at this uh, little cottage. And... It was a nice little cottage, a two-bedroom cottage, and one guy was moving in. And he had this big, massive, S-class Mercedes. I reckon the Mercedes was more worth more than the cottage. And I thought to myself, there's a corporate man just got divorced. I could have been totally wrong. He could have just been a single man and didn't like like big cars and small houses. But that's what my picture in my head my hat and I suddenly thought gosh that could be me I'm going to get a little cottage on my own I've got the big car outside I didn't have as big a car as this biggest class Mercedes to say no doubt but so I had a nice Mercedes and um, I thought this could be me and uh, I'd been doing all the wrong excuses to my wife saying you know she had a nice car in the drive and you know I had to use nice holidays and um just before we got to that, I'd taken my wife away on a dream holiday. We'd gone to Dubai and then on to Bali. This dream holiday and, you know, tried to patch things up. And weeks pass as you get back, not many weeks, and we get back to where we were before the holiday, you know. And and um, the story kind of ends where my son said to me, my oldest son was the teacher, said, what the heck are you doing, Dad? And... Because of the combination of what was happening with my new boss and now we just didn't get on, um, what's happening with my wife, they kind of came together like a crescendo, really, and um, I had a break in. This is Mr. Tough Guy, and I was that guy. I, you know, you couldn't break me. I didn't understand my uh, mental health, and I, um, I didn't understand and so in my 30, 30s and 40s I was probably quite cynical about people problems. there was lack of understanding back then but even so and I had a breakdown and when you have a break my breakdown it was really pretty bad in that I remember sitting at the keyboard of my computer at home and I'd gone to the doctor and I got signed off and I couldn't I can touch type I'm like, I've learned to touch type I couldn't actually Time. I could, my brain couldn't figure out what to do with my fingers. I always remember that day. And I, I had to put an email to, the other, to HR and I couldn't actually do it. I just, my wife just couldn't do it. I knew what I wanted to say and my brain knew what I wanted to do, but my hands would actually work. And then when I was trying to do it with two hands, my brain still couldn't coordinate it because it looked like it was dyslexic on the screen. And um, I was in a, in a pretty bad place and I felt like a failure at that. Anyway, not going into any details, which I don't want to do. We, I part a company with the company. They wanted me out, I guess. Yeah, certainly the new boss did. And I felt the failure. I wasn't, but I felt it. Um, that shame came back a little bit. But the thing that got me picked up was I came another mentor. I, I was forced to cover it by me private health insurance and I, I had a, a psychologist I worked with who was really good, really good. And he worked with me for about five, six months and then the support of my wife. And I got through it and I came out the other side. But I then I stood there thinking, what do I do now? I applied a few jobs, went for an interview, 
didn't feel confidence in it. I hadn't been in an interview for 40 years. I'd just been offered positions, so that was something. I'd interview plenty, but never done an interview. Um, and I started to think, well, what does this failure look like? And um, my son said to me, my, uh, why don't you just go back to coaching? And that's where my story started. And, 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 um, I I got into coaching and um, and I had that whole thing came back to me about the belief. Just teach people what I've learned over 40 years. Um, you know, I didn't have a coaching qualification at the time, but, but then I'd done... Uh, but I've done an MBA, so uh, in my late mid forties, that was tough. And uh, you know, I'd been in business, run businesses, coach businesses. I knew how how it worked and what to do. And um, I learned one thing, and, um, which I would knew about, but created the, my success. I wasn't driven anymore. I wasn't driven to be the best coach in the country. It wasn't in my plan. I actually ended up being there, weirdly, I'm not going to go into that, of one of the top coaches in the country, and you know, there's a thing with Rachel, a league table, and uh, I've ended up being one of the top coaches in the country. But that just happened by default, because I went back to, all I do is give the very, very best client customer experience that just blows their mind, and... I think about that every time I go into a coaching session. I treat every coaching session like it's their first coaching session. And, uh, you, you know, it's an exhausting job at the end of the day. I'm, you know, but that, that I, when I thought I was a failure, I went, when I, yeah, when you Google it, if anybody who's listened to this who has a breakdown will understand it, is you've, particularly if you've come from a very strong place like I did of never breaking under, and you know, in, in all the roles, in particular the cover roles, I'd had some tough places I've been, and I always just, I'll get to this, this will, it will get overcome it, we'll overcome it, we'll overcome it, and then just a stat like that, and it was a literally stat, it happened over a couple of days, it just something snapped. Well, was there any signs? Was there any signs pre prior to that? Yeah. There's no signs at all. Uh, um, Are you under a lot of stress and pressure though? Yes, and he was under a lot of stress and pressure. Me and the, this boss of mine were not getting on at all. He was doing the things that I didn't agree with and uh, didn't like. Um, he wasn't nasty, to be fair to him. He, we'd have conversations. We fell out a few times, no doubt. And uh, but he, I was under a lot of pressure. One thing dire, you know. Um, things were not going as well as they could have been because of that. And I've never regrets about it. In the end, it was the best thing I ever did because I've ended up in a place where I'm, I'm working for myself. I do something I love. Uh, I'm very successful at it. But it's, all, it's based on a different thing. I, I, I'm not based on... I'm based on the, the client now. It's all about the client, the experience they get, and that's just created something. As the failure that my failure was, it was about a lot of the time before me, it was about my journey. I forgot about my, I was a failure then. I'd forgotten about my wife, I'd forgotten about the family, I'd forgotten about other people. It was about me going up through that corporate ladder and getting to the top. And though I'd joined in quite high up, I was actually doing the MBA, you know, that took a lot out of the family. I did a, 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 a full on MBA out of Liverpool and you know, I was working with the MBA doing at least 85 hours a week. I was working every Saturday. Because I had to do my MBA and work at the same time. And I had a high cost job. So I was doing eight, a good 85. I was getting up every morning at 5 o'clock, Monday to Sunday. And and I'd work on my MBA till about 8 o'clock. Then I'd go to work. Then come home about 6, say, half past 6, half past 2. Then sit down about half past 10 and do my MBA till about half past 10. Every Saturday from five in the morning till about four in the afternoon and Sundays I'd do from five in the morning to about 11. Well, I thought it was great. I was doing this MBA, but my wife, my family, they were all missing out. And uh, it's, you know, they're the failures and there's lots of those type of things that happened on that journey. So, I've, you know, you, you have to learn that. And I still forget today, 
you know, sometimes I get going with something I forget about the family when I shouldn't. But, you know, this afternoon I've had the grandkids around. We've had the grandkids around. But I thought I've been working, they've been here with Mandy and, uh, and you know, I had a small break and my granddaughter comes in and I'm sat here to, just at this desk today reading another bed on to favourite book off the shelf. And mm-hmm. uh, just then he started to realise what, you know, what the real important things are not to go to that place of failure. So would you have done anything differently over that period? Yeah. Um, I shouldn't have joined the corporate world. Uh, I, it's, you, you know, in my case, it felt like I sold my soul to, to the company, to the main, because to be, to, you have to, they say you have to do that in every company you don't, but the company I did, it feels like you have to virtually sell your soul and to really drive forward and give yourself to the company. Uh, I moved a lot with the company. Uh, it's things like that. I moved five times uh, around the country for doing that, and that has an impact on the family. And so I wouldn't do that again. But the, but it's a life's journey, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, would I be in this real happy place I am today if I hadn't gone through all those those things and the things I've made mistakes? But it's about learning from them and doing it differently. As today, I try to do things differently. Do I always get it right? Um, one thing, you can see all those that middle shelf of book for business. I'm a big learner. I read it. I read incessantly now. Um, and learning and learning and learning, um, but I still make or still make the mistakes. Um, I just make a few less of them, and when I do make a mistake, I, I kind of learn from it. And I do that with my clients as well. My clients who they don't realise it, that they're a massive source of learning. For me. I watch things. I watch some of them do. It amazes me. They're just incredible people who can create out of something very little a big business success they create and I learn hugely from them to say you know in the last five years 50% of my learnings come from my clients and it's a really intriguing set of circumstances I suppose when you you've got this history of not having failed and then essentially some of those circumstances leading to towards you know having having a breakdown and feeling uh, you know your words indestructible do you think if you had failed at some point in your career you wouldn't have been in that mindset and you wouldn't have had a breakdown um i don't know the answer to that i think one of the things is uh, i'm a great believer is when you're successful, and anybody who listens to this who are in a place of success, I, I, I'm there currently, it just feels really easy. It does. It just, it just it feels easy. You know, I have lots of people approaching me. I can't take them on one type of clients of mine. And so it feels easy to find business because you're successful. But the lesson I'd say to everybody is, the failures when it goes wrong. And, and though I've never totally failed, I got close to the time and I've viewed it and I failed my family uh, and nearly got as close to a divorce as you can. That's where the learning is. And you have to, for some of us, it, for my one point of the breakdown, it became too big and I broke at that point. But I'd had lots of on the way of, of things that had gone wrong to get to where I was is to that's where you've got to pick yourself up and learn what do I do differently tomorrow so going all the way back to me when I was 21 and those bailiffs knocking on the door that was from one of the slim in mind that was I learned I have to do something different I have to do I could have just rolled over at that point and Matt said to man look let's give up I don't know how we're going to get out of this situation but we'll have to hand them the bag the van back and we'll have to do it but I gave them my days taking just to make them go away. They said they were going to be back, and I don't remember. They did come back and they collected the, the, the arrears off. I don't remember the details of that, to be fair. Um, but I changed. I learned from it, and I thought, I've got to do something differently. And that experience where I mentioned it, that young man in the northeast of Middlesbrough was sitting across from it. He wasn't prepared to change. And... 
that's that's the skill you've got to be have is you've got to when you fail, which you'll fail in big failures, little failures, but you have to take the learning from it and think, what am I going to do different so that happens to get to get it? I've been of a certain way. I'm, I, it's not through luck. I've had a little bit of luck, I guess, if I'd never had a massive something happen to me from a point of view of another person or company impacting me that forced me, forced a failure on me. But I, I've I've had lots of little failures that have net, fortunately have come in, they've worked out that they've never I've learned from and they never had a massive crash. The crash I did have was on my mental health. I pushed myself too far on my health and that broke. But, you know, great psychiatrist, a psychologist, sorry, put me back together. And um, um, I, six months later, I came out of it. I wasn't fit and great. I wasn't, I was probably 70% to 80% of myself, but within a year, 14, 15 months, I was back to a 100% and 110% of myself in a better place and a better learning from it. And again, I've learned from that. I've learned that you've got to be careful not to do certain things and not put yourself into certain circumstances that break you. I, I, I can feel them sometimes when it's some things and I go, but I, you know, I have a very strong mindset. I, you know, people here, I, I said to my clients now, I have this thing, I focus on it. I, I never, ever have a bad day. I have a bad hour. I've had occasionally about two or three hours worth of something. I've never had a bad day. That bad day is coming one day. I know when my mum dies, that'll be a bad day. But that hasn't happened yet. My dad died, but he was dying for two or three months. He had to, you know, uh, we knew it. He was at peace with it. He's a very religious man. And he, as he said, I'm ready to go. And it was kind of a, it didn't feel like a bad day. And the funeral was great. You know, he, he he lived to 88, had a good life, you know, so it didn't feel like a really bad day. And I felt for my mom, and, you know, my mom's okay now. And, uh, but, you know, a bad day will we made when something happens to my mom. Um, and if anything happened to the family. And how do you maintain that level of positivity to? ensure that you know there's setbacks there'll be setbacks that happen throughout the day right how do you let them not overwhelm you i suppose one of my coach mentors taught me this a very very long time ago i don't remember how old i was but it feels like i've never met known it forever this is the situation he, he kind of explained it it's i can't get it for word for baton because i don't remember it exactly but it's this and we've all been in this situation where Something is going wrong, or done. Some, you said something wrong to upset a client or a customer or a family member, really bad, whatever it is. And we go back home, let's say, and we go to bed, and we're worrying about it, and we wake up the next morning thinking about it. We th just think about it. We think about it. But two or three days down the road, we've all been there. We can't remember what we were worrying about because something else has come along and life's moved on, and. And that's, the, that's where I come from, is that tomorrow's a new day. There, there, there is that saying, I can't remember exactly, where people look at the past, present, and future. And some people look at the past with regret, the present with unsureness, and the future with fear. And some people, and I'm one of these people, I've come to learn this, I've been taught this, to look at the past for learning. The today, an exciting opportunity today and the future with utter excitement of what it holds and and today in the world we live in there are a lot of bad things and there are going on wars and everything but the, the things that are happening in the world have been given to us as opportunities are a lot easier and better than they were for my parents for me you know i mean why well, i wish i was 21 today in the future that's there and so and sometimes we get focused by through listening to the news or just in discussions on all the things that are wrong. But there's a lot of great things happening today. You know, you look at the homes people live in today to what they lived in in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, there's a lot to be grateful for and thankful for. And it's 
life is pretty good for what most of us. So not for everybody. Some some people have terrible circumstances that are being put upon them. And you know, I work with a charity, uh, and, you know, um, who are, who deal with people like that, and I see some, and that always keeps me appreciated. I see what some people's lives are like. So I get up and while it's there for me, I go out and I have to appreciate. I'm not going to talk about what's going on in the world and I could be there, but I, if I look at the people, that, uh, the, ch the charity uh, that I work with and those people come through that door, you know, I should never be waking up in the morning and complaining or complaining about this kind of morning. So I, I think about that message about when you worry and you can't remember what you're worrying about two or three days later and that, Having that positivity of learning from the past, today's a new opportunity in the future is just full of excitement. Amazing. So, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs about handling a fear of failure? And I think I'm going to add a, an addition to that, which is we talked a lot about not just the fear of failure, but the shame of failure, which is often related to the fear because people don't want the shame so they're fearful of the shame mm -hmm. but that often holds people back from starting businesses what would you say to them well if it just it's very difficult to answer that easily but, but there's something i teach in one of the principles i teach to my clients about the word fear and i turn it into we've turned it into an acronym and the acronym is false expectations appearing real and a lot of the problems is with the fear of failure is we build up in our mind an outcome, an expectation that's not actually real. And we then start to believe it sometimes. And then we start, we, we, we can't stop it. We, we, we are automatically work towards that outcome. And it's about stopping. And I always say to everybody is, you know, you've, you not you've not got a guaranteed success by putting a plan together. But the first thing you should do if you're in a bad spot is sit down, get some wise owls around you, and put a plan together. There are lots of them out there and they want to help. Go and seek out some wise, successful owls. As I, I did that with me. I I was always searching them out. And put a plan together and listen to them and work that plan. And it will turn round. Too many times I watch it, as I said, going right back. I was talking about that person. Now I went into a conversation and I told them about putting a, a business, a financial business plan together so they could work out the break even. And I gave them three or four things and they didn't do any of it. That, that's, 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 the, that's the road to failure. It's as easy as that. Do nothing. You're going to fail. If you carry on doing what you're doing, just do nothing. Don't make no change. You're going to fail, probably. Very well, probably. Um, in my view, is put a plan together. Not not a financial plan particularly. That might be part of it, but a plan. Going back to when I was 21, my plan was I ordered 50 toolboxes because I worked out that if I could sell these 50 toolboxes, it happened to be on a real great promotional deal, and the profit from that would get me out of the hole I was in. And I set off every day, and as I said right back then, every workshop I went into, garage I went into, Somebody was buying a toolbox off me. That I, when I went in, that was it. And I remember doing doing that. And I dragged everybody out there, out there to see my toolboxes. And I sold like fifty toolboxes in about eight. Days. Now, that, just to give you an idea, just about this toolbox, you would probably sell twelve to fifteen a year. And I did fifty in so many days. So it kind of puts in a little bit of context that does. Um, and yeah, it happened to be on a great deal. But yeah, you know, the company came to me and wanted to know what the heck had, what I'd been doing. How did I do it? And they, at the time, there was some write up about me doing it, you know. And um, you know, but it's about having putting a plan together to get you. And if you have that outlook every day, um, that's a, a great thing, you know, to just do that. And I don't know if that answers your question. I guess no, no, it does. No, definitely. So, last question then. If you could go back in time and erase either of those kind of challenging 
setbacks from happening in your life, would you do it? Are you doing the breaking? Yeah. I've had to go through that pain to come out and become the person I've become. And I am the most content, at peace with myself that I've ever been in my life. And, uh, you know, but I had to go through all of it. I had to be that 21-year-old lad who went so very naively and nearly go bust to learn. I had to go to be able to sit in front of people and convince them. The first person I convinced in, in my life was that bank manager. He was a lot older than me. He was in his 50s, and I'm this 21-year-old. and I know how to do that now. Um, to seeing failure in its worst form in my eyes at that parents across that table. And, you know, all the things that I did did not treat my family well and just focus on me and learning from that now that's made me. And, and that's kind of... The mosaic of life, isn't it? You, as long as you learn from things and you decide to make some changes, it's it's what it, 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 you create a good path for yourself. And Mandy and I have um, tried to do that as best we can with our children. And uh, I, I, I kind of give you this little story that what, I, what Mandy and I have become, really. Is so, uh, one of our grandchildren, uh, Polly, had just lit up the road. Now for Christmas, uh, we bought them a book advent calendar. So it's a great big, massive book with 24 books, little books in it. And um, every night, Mandy or I go up, went up from throughout December, each night, and sat and read her a story. And she's uh, she's not three till the end of March. And uh, I would never have done that. 25 years ago, but well, I do it now, and it's just a brilliant feeling. And we bought her for Christmas what they call a reading cushion, so it's a cushion, it's got some characters from the book she loves, and we put the book, there's a little sleeve at the back, you slide the book in. This little girl has just become, I've watched her through all the time that we do it, but it's the same kind of thing we are, we're just an avid reader. And I always, and that's like I am an avid reader, and she'll learn, and, get, and it will help with her, and that's all of that things from my life have led up to make, you know, doing those sorts of things, um, for, something for others, being, being, um, working with a charity, you know, has given me a lot. So like most of us, you know, it's the journey that molds us. And fortunately for me, it's molded me into a place that you know, I like being at. That's kind of where I am. Absolutely. And that's a great place to, end before we do i have a quick fire round as we always end on a quick fire round so this is as uh, short questions and uh short answers failure is inevitable for some what's your life's mission today to be the best granddad in the world Nice. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to others on your deathbed? Don't worry. Don't, don't allow worry to consume you. Don't entertain it. The, the tomorrow's a new day. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Affirmations. I do affirmations every day. If you could be immortal, would you take it? It will be a mortal every day when I take it. I guess the answer to that would be no. And, and the reason for that is the people I love most, I'd have to go to their funeral and I'd hate it. It would destroy me. I could just imagine going to my daughter and my children's or my grandchildren's and I couldn't do that. So no, I wouldn't take it. What's one surprising fact not many people know about you? Um, I don't actually think I have any uh, surprising facts. Yeah, I get asked that. I've been asked that two or three times. And, um, I've always struggled with that. Uh, I, I have this weird fact, and this is because I'm a coach. So um, it's not a quick question to answer, really, but I'll tell you anyway. So um, 
uh, when we we've moved to a beautiful part of the world, we, we live on the edge of the Peak District, and we fortunately look out and are across a golf course. Never played golf in my life, so we moved here when I was 50, 59, three years ago, and um, never played golf in my life. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to learn lead golf. And as most people do, they, if they're lucky, they go and have four or five lessons, and then go and whack a few balls and do what they do. And this is, the unusual fact about me is this: that's not me. I'm a coach. I found myself a golf coach. I've been learning three years. And I think I'm around about 120 lessons, and I'm pretty good. Okay. And that's about the only unusual fact I could think of to it. <laughs> Mike, I'm, everybody who plays golf on a tour, you've had how many golf lessons? I think I'm like crazy. Do you know what I mean? Uh, look, I think the golf course go cheap. Oh. Ask me. Think some. You know, and he said, "You are you you are very unusual, and you've become very good at what you do." You know, and that's because again, I put somebody around a wise owl around me, who just got around golf. And say, so, mm. yeah, it's, so you just continued the pattern of finding a, a mentor, really, and then put and then put the practice in. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly it, and that's the same in business. No different. It's a great analogy for business as well. Yeah. yeah. And, my, and I also have a, I, I live with a wise owl as well. And she keeps me uh, very much on the straight now. Okay, last one. Who can you recommend that you think I should have on as a guest? Who do I think you should, I think you should have my coach. And the reason I say that is she's one of the wisest owls I've ever come across. Um, this lady, Rachel Woods, I'll ask her tomorrow. I'm, she coaches me on a Wednesday morning at 7.30 every week. And uh, she's one of the wisest individuals I've ever come across. Right. The learnings, coach to coach is difficult, as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, well, not that I wouldn't say that's a of the, the coaching a successful coach is difficult, I would say, is what I would say. Um, but, um, just a very wise owl I've come across, very grounded. Wise owl. Great. Thank you. I'll look up, um, Rachel. Phil, where can people find you and connect with you? They'll find me on LinkedIn, uh, Phil Nasser, and uh, so you'll find me on my name. Uh, of course, the unusual surname, very easy to find. Under Lester, you'll find me. It's, well, my business is based in Leicester and so very easy to find there or well, if they want to email me it's philnasso at actioncoach.com simple as that similar one mm -hmm. yeah but reach out to me on LinkedIn I'll always talk to people you know so, yeah brilliant thank you I will put that in the show notes um, thank you again for, for being here I know you're a busy man so I really appreciate uh, your time managed to well glad we managed to get that a date in the diary finally so thanks so much and thank you yeah you've shared so much today and you shared lots of honesty and and you know some difficult subjects so i appreciate your honesty and um yeah thank you for sharing with everyone my pleasure my pleasure Jim. thank you for listening to beyond the fail really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review it really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.